Well, hello, today we're going to recap an Apple HD 20 SC external hard drive enclosure. That's zero footprint, zero footprint, meaning it's the same width as the compact Mac that you're looking at right now. You can actually see it if you look down directly beneath the SC 30 here. Uh, this was released in September of 1986 to coincide with the release of the Apple 2GS. The 2GS can use it if you have the appropriate SCSI card, but it was primarily intended to be used with the Macintosh Plus, which came out in January of 1986, because that was the first Mac to have a SCSI port on it. And SCSI was so much faster than the serial hard drives that came before. Uh, this particular recap video is focusing on the power supply made by Sony. CR-43 is the part number. The same Sony power supply was used in all of the models, which includes the 20SC, the 40SC, the 80SC, and the 160SC. So regardless of which of those models that you may have, or maybe you want to purchase one, this video will apply to you. Now some of you may say, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But um, usually people who say that are not people who are intimately familiar with vintage computers. And especially you SE30 owners know quite well that leak capacitors can wreak havoc on an old machine. Uh, even if they, they don't leak, uh, still the electrolyte can dry up and your computer just doesn't work right. Now, in the case of my drive, the ones you're looking at today, uh, it, the drive actually works. Uh, there's not, not any noticeable problems with it. However, because again, it came out in 1986, right? And we're towards the end of 2019 now, it's more than 30 years old. And capacitors, I'm sorry folks, but they don't have eternal life. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That phrase itself is broke when it comes to recapping. You need to throw the phrase out the window, buy new caps, and recap yours. And if you're not using yours, well, uh, maybe it's because you have one of the original hard drives in it. You can actually take out that drive, that old five and a quarter inch, uh, slow, painfully noisy drive, and put a more modern SCSI hard drive. But that's the ticket. It has to be SCSI SCSI, no IDE, no SATA, you know, don't use those modern hard drives you can buy on Amazon today. You're gonna to have to find a SCSI drive, 50 pin, but uh, if you've got a SCSI drive that's a more modern one, believe me, it will be a world of difference compared to the stock hard drives that came with these enclosures. Uh, the other benefit is, is, you know, yes, hard drives do fail, but um, they don't fail as often as you may have heard. And these hard drives, even though there are SD card solutions, uh, if you've got a hard drive, why not use it, right? Why not use the case? If, if this particular S Apple HD SC series is in your closet, pull it out. Uh, a recap will uh, most assuredly restore it back to new life. And it's not a guarantee. Uh, if you have a blown transistor or something, this video is, doesn't cover that. But in many cases, the uh, replacing, replacing of the capacitors will fix the problems. Now, I do want to mention that you can't just go out and replace all of the capacitors with the best capacitors on the market for this particular Sony power supply because it requires minimum S, S, uh, it requires minimum ESR for one of the, one of the capacitors, which means it has to have a minimum level of resistance inside for it to be stable. And we're going to investigate that later. I have uh, oscilloscope waveforms and everything to show you how that is. Also, be sure to look down in the description because I have a lot of information there, including a Mauser cart. So all of the capacitors that you need are in that cart. And then it's just a matter of taking those capacitors and following this video and you're on your way. I'd also like to mention that this drive, you know, the drive enclosure back in the day, it, it came out, even the 20 megabyte version at $1,300. So you don't wanna just, <laughs> I mean, this was a valuable piece of equipment back in the day. And it, again, it fits right under your, your compact Mac, whether it be a plus or an SE or an SD30. So, uh, it actually benefits you a little bit because it raises up the screen to a little bit better viewing angle. Plus, you know, uh, you've got that, that means to either have a second hard drive or pull the spinning platter drive that you may have inside your SC or SC30, pull it out and put it in this drive enclosure because those drives can get hot and that heats up the internals of your machine. And if you have other upgrades, then you want to do something that can reduce heat and putting those drives into an external enclosure uh, will do the trick. Now, if you have an S a SCSI to SD card solution, uh, you don't really need to work uh, to uh, be so concerned about the power supply because y you can use the bus power. But for a spinning platter hard drive, this video applies to you. So let's get started. Opening this case is unfortunately not very easy, but with this video, it should be much easier, assuming you have the right tools. Now I've put uh, these little round uh, white 
sticky things with arrows to show you this is the back with the power switch you need to start here don't start with the front or the sides you need to start here first and there are two tabs that you're going to have to push down with a tool like this I recommend a flathead screwdriver very small one that can fit in here so you can push down on these tabs and then you're going to need I would suggest a thin piece of metal I use this uh, to as a Mac cracker I actually have uh, two pieces of them um, but any any piece of metal will do I'm not sure if a credit card is really strong enough uh, but this piece of metal is and you're going to need to fit it into the gap here which uh, <laughs> You've got about a millimeter, maybe a millimeter and a half of gap already. So what you're going to need to do is put your tool in the gap, and then you're going to need to take your other tool, your screwdriver here, and you're going to need to push down such that uh, this little tab will, you're going to push down, and then you're going to twist this counterclockwise like this. And I was, uh, wasn't able to do it here on this one. Sometimes the right side is easier. Uh, so I'll start here. Just because over here there's the fan and there's a piece of metal here. And the tab hits that piece of metal. So it doesn't go back as far as this one does. So we'll start over here. The gap is a little bit less over here, but see, once you push in, the gap widens, so put your tool here. And in this case, you're going to want to twist this piece of metal uh, clockwise, okay? So I'm going to push down, and almost got it there. Well, the point here is you're going to want to keep this opened up push down on this side and then the gap stays open you're going to do it counterclockwise on this one and you're going to have to apply some force ah, and we did it okay you can see the gap i'm not holding it open it's open on its own and you might want to, if you have anything thicker, like another plastic tool to, to stick in there, you can try to widen it more. But that is the first step. And the next step is to go to the sides with this gap opened up. And as you can see, we're here on the side. I've got the tab here marked with the arrows again for you. You Again, same tools, right? But make sure that your gap is opened up in the back first. And because this gap is wider, this tool may not be the best. You might want to have some other plastic tool so you don't twist and eat too much into the original plastic. But basically, just like before, you're going to... This screwdriver is... the width of it is small enough it'll fit into this little indentation hole here. If you have too much of a wider screwdriver, it won't fit. So that's important that you have a screwdriver similar in size to this one. And we're going to... Uh, push down, and then we're going to twist and pry. And uh, easier said than done, but here we go. Okay. And it's staying open by itself because we had the back open. All right. And so the same thing over here. Now that this side's open, you can go to the front. We're gonna, uh, we're, the, the way I'm applying is counterclock, counterclockwise, twisting action on this metal piece here while I'm pushing down. And there it comes out. And yet another side. Um, this is the flip side to what we were just working on. Same thing I told you before. Uh, start at the back. And again, we're we're twisting this piece of metal counterclockwise while pushing on this. Maybe even put your tool over here. Might be easier. I just uh, another little plastic off there. Push in, 
hard and you're going to need to twist. And you can see it came open there. And the same thing over here, counterclockwise twisting while pushing. And maybe even do clockwise actually over here. So here we are in the back again. We now have the back and both sides uh, opened up. So what you're going to want to do is continue to slowly push it up like that. And you can see the tabs that were there. Then you're going to flip it over. Open it up a little bit more and then flip it. And okay, you saw that pop open there, right? And taking the lid off finally reveals the internals. And uh, on mine it says uh, July 27th, 1988. So I don't know who wrote that, but uh, from 1988, this particular model. Here are the feisty tabs that we had to contend with in getting off the top lid. Amazing how much trouble that these little tabs cause. Of course, you've got two more exactly the same on the opposite side uh, of the case. And you can see the little hole in the middle. That's where the uh, top case tab little button fit into. And this shows you how the tabs line up. Now this top part of the case, this is actually um, fits into the other side. Okay, but I just want to show you the alignment. This tab here goes here. This tab here goes here. And actually the tabs on the top part of the case, this little thing that sticks out here and right here, that will go on the outside of this right? It's not the inside. So this will go through this hole from, from this side and this side here. So maybe by saying this, you can better see how to pry it out. But in any case, it's, it's not, certainly not an easy thing to do. And of course, in addition to the two tabs on each side, you've got these two tabs in the back to contend with. And you can see the little piece of plastic sticking out here and here that fits into yeah you've got all these vertical slots right so it's this one goes into the leftmost slot this one goes into not the rightmost slot but the second one from the right and it's pretty easy to get these figured out because you've got that little piece of plastic here that doesn't go all the way to the top like these do same over here and last but not least we have this tab, this long tab, and this short tab, which fit into the here, here, and here on the front. So in all you've got, you can see why we had trouble uh, getting off the top case. Now that the lid's been removed, we can see what's inside. I had replaced the stock hard drive with this three and a half inch IBM DGHS 4.5 gigabyte hard drive, which is a nice size. You can partition it up, use it for system six, seven, even eight, if you've got the right machine. And uh, this is the stock fan back here. To make it a little bit quieter, I put a resistor in line with the red power wire. The resistor I chose uh, is 100 ohms. You can see that brown, black, brown, that's 100 ohms. And then gold is uh, plus minus 5% tolerance. And it's a one quarter watt size. And I know it's sized correctly because I measured uh, 3.46 volts across the resistor. And I also know it's 100 ohms. So with Ohm's law, we know that the power is about 120 milliwatts. So technically a 1 8 watt resistor would be fine, although it might get a bit warm and that's why I went up one to a 1 quarter watt or 0 0.25. So 
even though you could use one eighth watt, if you use 100 ohms like I am, I recommend a quarter watt and uh, that should run cool no matter how long you have the drive turned on. To remove the power supply, you need to pull back on this tab. Don't pull it too hard. This is old plastic, by the way. Just pull it back and lift it up. To take off the lid, we need to remove two screws. Here's the first screw. And the other screw is over here. And it's a matter of just prying it off. To remove the wires, you just get a little metal tool. You push in on this tab here, and then you can easily take it out. The first thing that we want to do before we start recapping is to check the voltage at the connector. Right now it's turned off, but I do have the power plugged in, the switch is off. We're going to check the voltage both with the hard disk connected and with the main connector disconnected. To remove this connector, we need to have a little tool fitted into these plastic tabs. You can see there's one here on the right, and we can see that there's one here on the left. If you have two tools, that will make it easier, but just for the sake of showing you, I'm going to put in the tool here and then pull on it, put in the tool here and pull on it, and you are technically able to do it that way with only one tool, and now it's removed. So I'm going to start with the main connector disconnected. So this is the no load situation, and my meter is showing zero volts because I haven't switched it on yet. Now if we take a look at the connector first, we can see that there are four black wires here. All of these are connected together at the circuit board. Also at the far right, there's two red wires, and those are also connected to each other at the circuit board. So what I have done is connected my black probe of my meter to one of the black wires and my red probe to the pin that goes into one of the red wires. So again, this is the no load condition. I'm now going to switch the power on. We can see at the red wire, we're getting 10.75 volts. Okay, I've switched it off, but if we look at the main connector again, we can see that the third wire over is orange, and that's where the 5 volt line should be. So what I've done is I've put my probe on that third pin over, so the orange, and now I'm going to switch it on and we'll check the voltage. And we get 5.3 volts, roughly. Looking at the connector again one more time, at the far left we see a yellow wire. This is also 5 volts. So I've put my red probe on that wire. The black, I shifted it over one, but it's still on one of the black wires. So now I'm going to flip on the power. And we see we get the same 5.3 volts. So all of these measurements are the no load condition. So now we're going to check it with the hard disk connected, which is a loaded condition, and it also will have the fan, the stock fan connected as well. So I have my red probe uh, on one of the red wires at the far right, and here we go, switching it on. So we see that the loaded condition uh, is different than the no load condition. Right, the voltage is slightly higher, and this is actually desirable and correct. We want about 12 volts, and we're getting 12.12. So now, change my probe. And uh, before we were getting 5.3. Now this is the loaded condition with the hard drive connected and spun up. And we're getting, as you can see here, 5.11, which is spot on what we need, we need roughly 5.
And now with my red probe at the far left on the yellow wire, we are seeing the same, roughly 5.1. Just for one more frame of reference test, I've put my scope on the orange 5 volt wire to see the peak to peak ripple noise. And here's the screen on my scope. We can see down here vertically it's 100 millivolts per division. So these blocks are each division. And we can see here that it's about 100 millivolts peak to peak. And uh, by the way, this is testing it with the hard drive spinning. So this is a loaded condition, which I felt, uh, you know, we could test it without a load and with a load, but uh, that would take a lot of time. So uh, just this test will be sufficient. It's showing you the peak to peak is about 100 millivolts. Um, grounding of the scope has an effect on this, but this is kind of the worst case, which uh, uh, my scope's ground is uh, a couple inches long. So uh, there's a little bit of noise induced through that. But nevertheless, uh, 100 millivolts peak to peak. And then after the recap, we'll show this again on the same orange wire for a frame of reference to show how good the capacitor selection that I made is. Ideally, of course, you don't want to have a greater ripple than this after you recap. Now, most of you won't have a oscilloscope like this, but I'm just uh, put, including it in my video because I do. And uh, most of you will just be concerned about the uh, voltage level, uh, both before and after uh, your recap. To remove the circuit board, the first step is to disconnect this connector here. It's very easy. And then it's time to remove screws. We have a screw here. We also have a screw here. But you must also unscrew these two parts, which are heat synced to the frame. And there's one screw on the side over here on the outside, and there are two screws over here. So I'll show you the one over here. And with that screw removed, uh, this is what you see. This little plate falls forward here. And there's this, uh, instead of heat sink compound, there's this little rubbery thermal transfer sheet that you don't want to lose. It's still useful. And now for our last two screws. Now that all the screws are out, we can remove our circuit board. Go ahead and move your little mounting tool here. Um, by the way, you need to remember how it goes on. So you can see here how the leg goes towards the right side it's bent towards where all of the components are. So when you put it back on, this is incorrect. You won't really be able to put it on that way anyway, but just to let you know that this is the correct way to put it back on. And here are our replacement capacitors from Mauser. If you use my Mauser list, uh, then everything is marked extremely well. So you shouldn't have any problem at all. Um, you can see that I marked this HT20SC. So if you're buying more than, if you're buying more capacitors than just for one project, you want to put which project that is. That's the HT20, HD20SC. And then I put in this bag, there are two capacitors. One is C181 and the other is C182. And so because you have this information, technically you can not need to worry because everything is silk screened very nicely. You can see C182 is right here, this particular capacitor. So everything is marked in white text. And if you just read the labels on the capacitors, um, then you'll be fine. Another great thing about these boards is, as with all the, the older Sony boards, is on the reverse side, this is the same circuit board. You can see uh, it says here, C over, over here, C182, and then C181. So all of the capacitors are marked on both top and bottom, 
which makes it very nice to know which solder pads you need to desolder. Okay, here's our work area. We've got our solder. I've got uh, a copper desoldering wick here. We've got our desoldering station set to 350 degrees Celsius. We've got our soldering iron attached and a wet sponge here. Um, we can also use this to clean off the solder and I'm just going to, it doesn't matter where you begin, I'm just going to start on this section uh, replacing these five capacitors to begin. And here is the bottom of the bore that we're going to be working on. We can see that, uh, as I mentioned before, all of the capacitors are marked. So we've got uh, C209 here, C214. These L's are the inductors. We don't want to desolder those. C213, C215, and C210. So those five capacitors. Now, to desolder, you can use a variety of desoldering stations, I mean, a variety of things to do it. I, I prefer the, the wick, that's just me. Uh, and to make it a little bit easier, I, I find that putting some uh, fresh solder on the existing solder uh, helps, or you can add flux. Uh, this solder has flux inside it, so it's basically like uh, adding that flux and it makes removing the existing solder easier. And then if you use a copper braid, um, you want to basically take the solder that's already there and suck it out with this braid. This braid will pull it out fairly well, um, except on some large ground planes it's a little bit more difficult unless you add more heat, but it still can be done. And sometimes you may need to add uh, a bit more solder. And they came right out. That was really quite easy. And again, we don't have to worry about which is which because they're all marked and on our bags as well. Now, if we look closely here, my eyes don't see a lot of leakage except for this one. This one has kind of a yellowish area around it, which indicates that that's probably leaked fluid. In any case, if we examine the board itself, it looks like there's this little shiny substance there. It could be leaked fluid. It could be just a coating that's really old. I'm not too sure, but in any case, we have uh, a swab and some alcohol to clean it off. And uh, we can just start anywhere. This one right here at this corner here says uh, C210. So we find a bag that has C210, and here it is. So we just basically are going to snip off that. And it's very nice because there's a plus on the outer edge. And then to get the plus, we can see that the, the minus is marked, so the opposite leg is the plus. Now you want to make sure that you push him down so that his bottom touches the actual board itself. Now if the capacitor is going to fall out, you need to bend the legs, but in this case uh, it's not. So I'm going to put on the solder. And then we can just snip off the legs, and if they fall on here, you want to make sure that they come off. And that one is soldered on. And we just proceed to do the others. I'm putting in C215 now, but I just wanted to point out one thing here. If you look here down in this area, you'll see a white dot. And that's just another convenience that these Sony boards give you to know, even after you've soldered in the capacitor, which side is ground. Because you won't be able to see the plus anymore. So the dot marks the ground. And I just also wanted to comment, uh, notice how I bent the leads out. 
and that's really the only way to keep them secure, the bottom of the capacitor secure to the bottom of the board while you're soldering it in. And uh, this isn't a video that teaches good <laughs> soldering practices necessarily, but I would recommend that you put your soldering iron first to heat the pad and then put your solder on and then leave it on there for a little while so that it flows and then pull it up quick like that leave it on And when you cut these off, close your eyes. <laughs> they, they sometimes fly in the air. So you don't want to get one of these stuck in your eyes when you're, when you're popping it off. And of course, when you, when you do this, don't dig into the circuit board copper traces and cut into them when you do it. So be, be careful about it. It's not that hard. It's just like what you see here. Anyway, uh, all of them are soldered in now. Uh, we'll clean off the flux on the board when we're all finished. Here you can see how they're, the bottoms are flush with the circuit board as they ought to be. And there they are. One, two, three, four, five. And as we go about doing this, always double check, triple check, quadruple check. Make absolutely sure your polarity of these capacitors is correct because there's no second chances. If you put it in wrong and power it up, they'll blow up. It's not going to be a TNT explosion that'll kill you or anything like that, but you're going to lose your capacitor. It's going to blow up. The, the top is going to explode out the internals. You don't want that to happen uh, because you probably didn't order any spares, right? So make sure the polarity is absolutely correct. And it's very easy to do on these Sony boards, just like I told you, but just always always check multiple times to make sure you soldered it in correctly and if you didn't solder it in right then just desolder it pull it out flip it around and and fix it it's that simple now we're going to do the big guy um, he's the biggest one of the bunch one one thing you'll notice that even though the height of the replacement is the same the diameter is not so this little hat here <laughs> this little cap you can take it off but um, it's not going to fit onto the replacement capacitor. And desoldering the big guy, C109, is no different than what I told you before. You just need to add a little bit of fresh solder or fleck, flux, if you have flux. But this solder has flux in it. And then just take your desoldering wick. If you've got a pump or a desoldering station, uh, uh, hot air, whatever you prefer to use, go ahead and use that. Again, I, I like the wick. The wick works for me. It wicks away the old solder and uh, it works fine enough. That's how he looks when he's removed. So again, we clean up uh, the place and then put in the new guy. So again, as we've been saying repeatedly, make sure the capacitor, the new replacement, is flush with the board before you solder him in. I put a little solder on my Soldering iron first, lay it on the pad, and then add some of the fresh solder. We're going to put more on here because the pads are bigger. And here is our replacement. Notice the little dot down there and the stripe so I have the polarity correct. Now if you put his little hat on you can see it's not going to be a tight fit but uh, that's okay. It's basically 
keeping the top of the case from touching it. I don't think you really need it, but if you want to leave it on here like this, it's not going to rattle around. Uh, if you want to permanently put it on, you can put some hot glue on it, I suppose, but I don't think you need to do that. You can either just leave it off or just uh, plop it on like this. It'll be fine. Now I went ahead and desoldered uh, C110 here, and I just want to mention this CR-35 daughter card. Probably for you, it'd be easier if you desolder these before you put this in. In other words, desolder C110 and your big cap first, then you've got your some more space to put in your soldering iron. You can desolder this and resolder it back in. It just takes time, and I'm not going to do that. <laughs> uh, and so I'm just going to... There's only two capacitors on here, and they're not really that difficult to reach. They're just over in this area. Uh, so, you know, I already soldered this in, and it's not, it's not going to bother me, but it may bother you, so I would suggest you just remove these two stock capacitors, and then you have some more leeway here. Try not to burn into this component. If, you, if you're worried about it, then just desolder the whole card. To desolder the whole card means you're going to have to desolder these pins and these pins, because there's two connectors on it. So it's just fiddly and troublesome, so I'm not going to do that, but again, if you want to remove the card, just do that. There's only one way to put it in, so you're not going to have a problem putting it back in. And these capacitors are stuck together, so you can just wiggle them, wiggle them out of place. And that's all there was to it. Here they are removed, still, still stuck together. And here are the two replacements for C181 and C182. I don't see any need to glue them together like Sony did. They probably did it for... Um, well, I can't really comment, but uh, keeping the lead shorter, I think, is best. So what we can what we can do is just put a dab of hot glue on uh, later to make sure they're secure. Uh, since they're sticking out, you know, they're going to be laying on their side. And here we are at the last. Uh, I've just soldered in C110. So we just have these three guys here. C C202, C222, uh, and C226. These three. And here is the fully recapped board. Now I'm going to apply a little dab of hot glue on these two capacitors, since they're going to stick out uh, on the side here. Then I'm going to put uh, some hot glue here on these two. And on the solder side of the board, I took my spray bottle of alcohol and let all of the flux drain off, so now it's all cleaned off. And that was last night, so it's been given 24 hours to thoroughly dry. Okay, I've put the power supply, screwed it down back into its case, slotted the bottom part of the frame case uh, back into the plastic case, and now we're going to do the no-load smoke test. No-load meaning the connector, you can see, is disconnected. It's not going to power the hard drive or the fan because we're just doing a voltage test. And this is something I encourage you to do. You want to make sure that your capacitor replacement job was good. So I have put the red probe of my meter uh, on the pin that's third from the right, which is should be 5 volts. That is um, on the connector here, the orange wire. And then I put my black probe on one of the uh, black pins, which is the second one over from the left. 
and it's plugged in and I'm going to switch on the power now. So we're getting 5.315 volts, which is good. I'm going to switch it off and then change to a different pin. Okay, now I moved it over to the farthest pin to the right, which is going to be 12 volts. Switch it back on. 10.80. And again, keep in mind, this is no load. Switch it off. The reason I'm switching it on and off is because I don't want to short out the pins when I change them. If I accidentally touch two. Okay, so now I've got my red probe on the farthest uh, pin over to the left, which is uh, the yellow wire. And I still have my black probe on the ground. Switching it on, we get 5.314, which is expected. And so now we'll go ahead and do the loaded test. We're doing it the same as before. I've got my red probe on the orange wire, which should be 5 volts. It's switched off right now. And the black probe on the ground. It's connected to my fan and the power and the hard disk. So here we go. Okay. So we're getting, now it's in the steady state condition, 5.11. I am now going to switch on the power so we can see the ripple on the scope. And what we're seeing here is quite a bit more of these uh, what we call ESL or these uh, spikes that are inductive, uh, typically inductive in nature, but these are higher than was the case uh, before the recap. And I know what the problem is. The problem is one particular capacitor. And uh, I believe very strongly that this power supply was designed so that there needs to be a little resistance inside the capacitor. In other words, the capacitor I chose, the Nichicon, is actually too good <laughs> for this particular design. Now, in addition to the noise you saw on the scope, the other problem is I'm hearing a sound that's coming from the area of this transformer when I first switch on the power, which seems to be the inrush current maybe is too high and it's making a little beeping or squealing sound. It's not very loud, but it wasn't there prior to the recap. And again, this is due to uh, the one capacitor I'll show you in a few minutes, but I'm gonna put my mic right up against the transformer and then switch on power so you'll be able to better hear the sound. The capacitor that's causing all this problem is this particular one here, C214. Um, usually it's not anything bad to go with a higher voltage and that's what I did. The stock capacitor is 10 volts. I used the 16 since that would allow me to use the same capacitor for both. But uh, I have removed this and put other capacitors in with higher resistance inside and they work fine. No beep. Everything's clean. So it's clear that we don't want to use too good of a capacitor for C214. And just for the sake of comparison I've soldered in the stock 10 volt capacitor, the one that came, shipped with this product, so you can see it on the scope. So I'm going to switch on the power now. And notice that we didn't get this waveform that we did with the good capacitor. This is the stock capacitor. And that waveform we saw uh, just before with the good capacitor, that's the beep actually. So we don't get a beep and we don't see the beep and we can also see that the peak to peak, even these little spikes, they don't go beyond, see it's 100 millivolts per block. So the height of this peak to peak is about uh, 100 millivolts. So it's less noise, no beep, the stock capacitor fixes it. But uh, if we want to replace the capacitor, then we're going to need to find something equivalent.
So there is no uh, beep, audible beep, and we were not able to see any audible beep here. However, we are seeing, um, even though it's about 100 millivolts peak to peak, nevertheless, the, the number of these ESL spikes uh, above that are ab above the ripple here uh, are a bit more than with the stock Rubicon capacitor. But nevertheless, it's a very usable capacitor. And we see something uh, quite similar, peak to peak. It's uh, right on about 100 millivolts peak to peak there, just like the uh, Cornell capacitor was. Also, um, quite a few ESL spikes, but extremely usable and no audible beeping sound. So we are seeing, uh, again, right about 100 millivolts peak to peak. Some of the ESL spikes are just over that. And uh, the number of the spikes looks very comparable to the other two capacitors we used. Uh, but all three of these alternative capacitors um, are the same in that there is no audible beep. And we don't see that beeping uh, waveform here either. So any of these three would be adequate and good to use for this HD20SC power supply. Now there is a little bit of wobble if you move these capacitors here. Uh, it's not too severe and it's not absolutely necessary, but if you have some hot glue, I would recommend adding some of that. Um, you can just put a dab between, I would say, these three capacitors just to glue them to each other and that way they're a bit more stable. And as you can see, just a little drop, actually a couple drops uh, between these two and between these two. and you can see it's it's quite a bit more stable. You know, your hard drive and other things will vibrate the case, so you don't want your capacitors vibrating around too much. And this hot glue will uh, ensure that they're stuck together. And you can see, even on some of the stock components like this, uh, Sony did basically the same thing with silicon to make sure the parts don't uh, move around. So before we put everything back together, um, I still have this taken out partly because there's a screw that has to be screwed in over here and over here, which means we have to have the harness in first before putting the lid back on. That means we want to put these wires through our little plastic grommet over here. Okay, 
and this guy will come out of the hole over here. So there's enough slack in the wire for us to do this. So this won't be connected. You could leave it inside, but it just hanging out is fine. And here's our wires coming out here. So then it's a matter of putting in the screws. And then we just put him in like just like we took him out. Getting the top lid on isn't really too difficult, at least not compared to getting it off, because you've got these pieces, thin pieces of metal on the front and on both sides. You don't have it on the back, but you don't need it. And these pieces of metal uh, fit very nicely into, that's what these, these guys are here. That's holding it, you know, you've got them on the sides, both sides. So that's what these metal pieces are for. Uh, that help you fit and align the case just right. And so um, it's really easy to put it back on because uh, once you get it fitted and then you turn it all the way around and, and look, uh, you basically just carefully push it down. And once you get the top bit fitted into those metal pieces, it should you should see on the back, always confirm the back before you start pushing it down, that the two tabs on the back are fitted at the beginning here into the little indentation slots here and here. And then really it is it, it, it just a matter of pushing it down. Just make sure you've got your two pieces properly in here. Run your fingers all the way around, nothing sticking out. Don't force it, obviously, you want to take it slow. You should hear the clicking sounds whenever the tabs make their way uh, into their respective slots. You can see there's almost no gap in the top crease when it's fitted in there, although there will be a gap around the sides. And if you have the most difficulty, it probably will be the front. You, you have to push it in a little bit this way while pushing it down. But uh, this is fully closed, and you can see the width of the gap here. It's um, just, there's the LED over here. So if you see you on your machine the gap is wider than this, then it hasn't fully locked into place. This is showing uh, the gap on the side, which of course needs to be the same. Um, width as the front and it's the same width as all of these other indentations so these are really your guide for gap thickness well now that we have everything recapped it's time for the actual boot test but to make it a little bit more interesting and exciting da -dun, da -dun, we're going to pit the SE30 against a mid-2015 MacBook Pro. You might say, why not a 2019? Well, folks, I don't have a 2019, but honestly, this is the last great MacBook Pro. It's quite fast, has a, it's fully loaded. It's the top-end 15-inch model, has the best CPU, it has discrete GPU, it has one terabyte Apple SSD, uh, maxed out RAM. It's, it's the best you can get, costing more than $4,000, okay? So we're going to boot this and the SE30 at the same time and see who wins. Now before I switch anything on, let me just tell you that this SE30 has a 50 megahertz socketed Daystar power cache accelerator inside. The stock frequency is 16 megahertz, so it's boosted to 50, okay? You might say, oh, I don't have one of those. Well, uh, you know, get one. <laughs> uh, this, uh, this accelerator will drive the hard drive a bit faster. So you can see that the spinning hard drive um, is actually boosted a little bit by the accelerator, but even in the stock condition, 
this particular hard drive has pretty fast performance. Um, also, I have a Rominator 2 Mega, which is a ROM replacement for this computer. And basically what it's doing is it eliminates the startup memory check, which is a ridiculous thing that Apple put in. That's a an extreme bother and that, that particular ROM gets rid of it. So it's very nice and it makes the comparison a little bit more fair. Okay. Because again, this has an SSD. This has a spinning platter hard drive that's, uh, well, I guess it was made around the year 2003 or so. So it's quite old and not quite as old as the SC30, but nevertheless old. Anyway, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to power up the hard drive to let it spin up first. I think that's only fair. Uh, this computer is going to boot into System 7.1, and it has, uh, you know, a fair amount of extensions and control panels, so what you might want in a normal installation. And this uh, MacBook Pro is going to boot into a brand new user that I created. It'll boot directly into the user, so I won't have to type in any password or anything like that. And what we're going to see here is how long it takes uh, for both of these to boot to the desktop. So let's see who wins. Who is going to win this one? A 68K Mac or the latest and greatest 2.8 gigahertz i7 Intel processor with SSD? 21 seconds. Oh, okay. So we saw that uh, the MacBook Pro booted first, but In less than 30 seconds, the 68K Mac gets to the desktop. Let's try System 6 now. Again, the hard drive is spun up already, so I'm going to switch on the computers and then start my timer. Ready, go! Wow! <laughs> Did you see that, folks? <laughs> 11 seconds and the MacBook is struggling now. Oh my. Wow. Okay, and now the MacBook gets to his desktop. So, uh, System 6 booted, right? It was about 11 seconds, right? So, 11 times 2, 22. So, it's more than twice as fast as this modern machine. The power of System 6. Okay, and now I'll leave you with some benchmarks just so that you can see how fast uh, this drive really is. Okay, we're still running System 6 here, and I've loaded up Speedometer 3.06, which is a ben benchmark utility that's compatible with System 6. I'm going to run all tests, and of course I'll speed it up so you don't have to endure all of them. And uh, actually it won't take 10 minutes, but I'll just show you I've started. Uh, and I've got, you can see the partitions over here. It doesn't matter which, so I'm just going to click OK. And it's going to start doing its thing, and I'll jump you folks to the end so you don't have to wait. OK, the tests are all done, so I'm going to show you uh, some comparisons on how fast this guy is compared to some other Mac models. So this machine compared to a Macintosh 2 FX. Now look at that folks, FX is over here. Notice how those bars are pretty short. <laughs> and this guy, yeah, especially that math score, right? 42.8. And over here, Mac 2 FX, wicked fast, 21.3. Take that, Mac 2 FX. Right. Yeah. Now of course, this is being influenced by my 50 megahertz 68030. Uh, but still, you know, the Macintosh 2FX really is wicked fast. It is fast. And that's just showing you how much faster this machine. KWET, take a look at that, 74.2. Over here, 28. CPU, 13.69. Mac 2FX, 11.45. Now the disk, 3.93. Woohoo! 1.45 on the 2FX. So this disk, you know, I've got a 4.5 gigabyte server drive in here, and the 2FX came with a much smaller and older technology, slower drive, so it kind of makes sense. But, uh, you know, this is just showing you that, well, I'm not only using a good drive, but my recap job was good too. 
Now, by the way, I do have a uh, Micron Exceed uh, grayscale card in here with the color 30 HR, and so it could do 2-bit, 4-bit, 8-bit, uh, in addition to monochrome, and that's why you see all of the benchmarks here. And actually, these scores beat the Macintosh 2 FX as well. Well, in conclusion, for those of you who watched this entire video, congratulations. You're now on your way to recapping your own Apple hard disk SC series external hard drive. Uh, be sure to remember down in the text description below this video, there is a mouse or cart there along with other information. You need to click show more if you're on a desktop computer or if you're on an iPhone, there's a little down carrot mark you click on and it'll expand out to reveal all the information. Mauser cart gives uh, all the capacitors you need for this Sony power supply. I'd just like to men mention though that if you're going to recap something else as well, you might want to combine those capacitors with the capacitors for this so that you have enough in your cart to qualify for free shipping. If you don't know what to do, well check out my other recapping videos because we cover the analog board, the Sony power supply and so on and uh, combining all those capacitors together uh, might qualify you for free shipping. The total for these capacitors is quite low. It's only like $14, not including shipping. So uh, uh, one last thing I want to mention is that over time, there might be some capacitors that are on back order. Um, some might even go out of stock. I'll try to keep the text description and card up to date, but if you need to substitute, uh, don't be afraid to do that. If you want to ask me what you should substitute, you can do that. But um, as of today, the making of this video, one of the capacitors was on back order, but they have more on order and it will be filled. So sometimes it's just a matter of waiting until they get that new order in. But uh, really, as I mentioned in this video, uh, it's just the one capacitor that is quite sensitive to ESR. So the other capacitors are lesser so. Just make sure you don't use any polymer capacitors that are really extremely low uh, ESR and, and you should be fine. So. Uh, I hope this information is useful to you and you can get your uh, drive, even if it's running fine, still you want to be, be sure to recap uh, that to make sure you're not going to have leaked fluid and it's going to fail you down the line. So anyway, thanks again for watching and I wish everyone a wonderful day.